Hey everyone, my name is Peter, and in today's scratch video, we're going to be making a bouncy ball. So by the end of the video, you'll be able to make something like this. Alright, so let's get started in a brand new project. Uh, so the first thing we want to do is, of course, get our bouncy ball. So we can just take these old costumes and select the ball. And whatever color you choose doesn't matter, as long as you don't have a bouncy cat. <laughs> So next, we always have to start with our when green flag clicked. This is obviously going to be when the user just clicks a green flag. That's when all this stuff starts to happen. So to start off, let's just make our ball go to some location that's not really in the center. We want to make it more towards the bottom so it has as much room as possible to bounce. I'll just put negative 200 and 0. So we can test it out. Oh, I accidentally used the x value. So Using the y value this time, if x is 0, y is negative 200, this should be centered at the bottom of our screen. There we go. Looks like negative 200 is a little bit too far. Let's go with negative 180. Oh, that is still too far. Negative 150, that should do it. There we go. So, that looks good. The first part is good. Now, for the second step, we have to do something that will come into play later. So, even if it doesn't make sense right now, what we want to do is point in direction, right? But we want to make it point in direction zero. And you might notice that this little arrow indicator here is pointing upwards. It's going to be important when we make our ball actually begin to bounce. Now, next, I want to go through some basic physics. So don't be scared. This isn't going to be any uh, Einstein or anything like that. Just basic physics, like um, the physics of a ball being dropped. Uh, since this is a bouncy ball, we have to make sure that it actually um, it falls as if it were a real object. So let's think about it. If this ball were placed um, someplace high, right, and then we let go of it, how would the ball fall down? It wouldn't just move down at a single speed. Instead, it would start as soon as you let go of it. If I just let go of it, it would start at a speed of zero since it does it had no time to speed up yet. But as it falls down, 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 it would speed up faster and faster. So that's one of the key concepts we're going to incorporate into this project. And it's called acceleration. It's basically a matter of increasing the speed as the object falls down. So if that didn't make sense to you the first time around, I'll show you how to implement it and then uh, we'll go from there. So another good um, another good pro uh, practice when in Scratch is to use several when green flag click blocks. This can help you organize your code as well as make things easier to read instead of having them all under one big chunk of code. So using multiple of these basically allows you to keep your code organized and make sure you know where everything is. Now what we're going to add is a forever loop underneath this and I'm going to create a variable. So this variable, I'm going to call airtime. And this can be for all sprites. So airtime is going to be the amount of time that our ball is in the air. And we're going to keep track of this. And basically, whenever the ball hits the ground, we're going to reset it because then it will be no longer in the air, right? So starting with airtime, I'll just uncheck that. We can first set it to zero because we always want to make sure that we set it to zero every time it hits the ground, but that should only be when it's touching the, um, the Y position that we want it to be in. So first things first, let's get an if, and then we want to check if the Y position is at a certain level. If we want to do that, we need to go to operators, and then we have to check if the Y position, so if the Y position is less than or equal to a certain number. Since in the first step, we set our original Y position to negative 150, we can check if it's greater than or it, sorry, if it's less than or equal to that value. So what I'll do is take this less than or equal to, and then I'll go to motion and look for Y position. Now this variable tells us the position of the ball. And basically if the ball is falling down, its Y position will be decreasing. By the time its Y position reaches negative 150, we will know that it has reached the bottom of the screen. So putting that inside the if, and then we can set airtime to zero inside of there, 
Then finally, one last thing is we have to change the y value to negative 150. And why I'm doing this is just to make things more consistent because when the ball is falling down, it might not land at the exact same y position. Doing this will basically just set it so that it's at the same time every time it hits the ground. So this is the first part of the forever inside of the forever loop. The second part we have to do is the actual, um, the actual part where the ball falls down. So how we do this is by taking another if first. And this if is going to check if the y position is greater than 150. And why we're doing this is because we want to see if the ball is basically basically still in the air or not. So there is um, a bit of redundancy here. Basically, um, the code doesn't have to be written this way, but I'm doing it this way because sorry, I'm doing it this way because in other cases you might not be using y position. Think about a project where you use the ground per se or another sprite that uh, that you use as the ground. In that case, you wouldn't be just checking if it was y position. Yeah. Um, instead, you'd be checking if it was touching that sprite. So in our case, we can use y position. I'm going to make it negative. So basically, if it's greater than 150, then it'll be in the air somewhere. And if it's not, it'll be on the ground. You could always uh, remove one of them. It would still be the same result. But for the sake of clarity, I'll keep this here. And you guys can always play around with that when you're making your own projects. But moving on from that, we have our next our next value, which we want to change, and that is going to be the y value. And since the ball is falling downwards when it's bouncing, we have to make sure that when it's from up here going down, we change the y by some negative value. Now, we figure out that negative value by figuring out how long the ball has been in the air. So how we do that is by saying change the air time by one every single second that it's in the air. This we put in the forever loop because we always change the air time no matter if it's um, in the air or not, but we know that if it's on the ground, we reset the air time. That means that the, the um, number of seconds or the number of air time that the ball is in the air for will always be accurate. So moving on from there, we can go and actually first set air time to zero at the very beginning. Uh, this will just make sure that it starts at zero. But after that, we can finally start to uh, include air time in here. So how will this work? Well, remember the physics I was explaining earlier, the longer the ball is in the air, the more it's gonna, the faster it'll fall when it uh, reaches the ground. So how we do this is by taking the multiplication operator and then we can take our air time and put air time multiplied by some value that we want it to fall by. So we can make this negative five for now, but you can always change it and see what happens. So what this will do is instead of changing y by the set value, let's say we change y by like negative 10, then it would just be a constant negative 10 on the way down. But what we did here is change y by air time times negative five this, instead of saying, oh, just go negative five down each time, we're saying whatever air time is, if air time is one, it'll go negative five. If air time is two, it'll go negative 10 and so on. That means the longer if the ball is in the air, the faster it'll fall as it reaches the ground. So before we can test this working, we have to make sure the ball has some way to bounce back up. And remember how I said we have to set the direction to zero at the beginning of the video? So this will basically make sure the ball is always pointing upwards. And that means it can always bounce upwards. So if we want the ball to basically follow our mouse cursor as it bounces up and down, we can first drag over another one of these um, green flag blocks and basically start another block of code. And in this one, we're going to have a forever loop. And in there, we can first set our x value to mouse x. And what this will do is make sure the ball always follows where our mouse cursor is. And the next thing we can do is finally say we can move a certain number of steps. I will say move 40 steps. And what that does is pushes against the force that is dragging the ball down. So the ball is going to be pulled down um, as it falls. But when it hits the ground, it'll also push itself back up. So let's see this in action and press the green play button. 
So boom, as you can see, the ball is going up and down, bouncing like an actual ball would in real life. And as I move my mouse cursor back and forth, you can see it follows along perfectly. So if you change around some of these values, like the airtime multiplied by some negative number or the number of steps you can go, you'll see that the ball either bounces higher or slower when it falls down. And you can always experiment with those values on your own. So yeah, that'll be it for today's video. If you enjoyed it, please like and subscribe and leave your own suggestions in the comments. I'll leave the description, uh, I'll leave the link to this uh, project in the description. All right, see you guys next time.